The mountains of West Virginia have provided generations with jobs in coal. But on January the 9th, 2014, the state woke up to an example of the cost of its industrial economy. A tank containing a chemical used in the process of coal production had leaked its contents into the Elk River, just a mile upstream from the largest water treatment plant in West Virginia. Water is scarce following a warning from West Virginia's governor. Do not drink, bathe, cook, or wash clothes That's using towels. Chemical leak, a chemical used to clean coal, leaked from a storage facility. The yesterday. state's health department says the water was contaminated with a potentially harmful chemical, MCHM crude. A federal investigation is ongoing, but this spill was just the most visible of many incidents in West Virginia, where in the past decade, the coal industry has recorded thousands of water violations. Fault lights come here to find out how the state's main industry affects its most vital resource. Little testing has been done on the chemical that leaked from these tanks into the river just below. After the spill, Freedom Industries declared bankruptcy, and they're supposed to remove the tanks from the riverbank. But a lot of people want the tanks to remain there because they say they're the best evidence of what some people are calling a crime scene. Officials say the water is now safe to drink, but some don't believe them. We've come to meet a group of volunteers who've been distributing clean water to people who still don't trust the tap water. Twice a week, they make a two-hour trip to fill a 400-gallon container with clean spring water. Three hundred thousand people plus have got poison water now and are t test subjects to see what happens when MCHM is in your drinking water. The task of giving everyone good water is too large. Too large for a handful of volunteers? Yeah. DJ's hometown, Printer, is served by the water supply that was contaminated. Like a lot of his neighbors, He's still refusing to drink the city water or wash in it. I joined up uh, with the Clean Water Hub because I believed in what they were doing and I felt that they were sincere. It was from the kindness of their hearts. To see people fight for something that they believe in and not just stand around and watch it happen. At the distribution site, people are lining up. I was taking a shower one day and it didn't have no smell and it burnt me up. It burnt you up? What do you mean? It burnt my skin, you know, put spots on this. Wow. How, how have you been getting by? I've been, I've been getting by but getting water wherever I can get water. DJ claims he was sick for two weeks from the contaminated city water because he drank it for several days before he heard about the spill. I didn't know that it was going on. I didn't have cable at my house, so I didn't know what was going on. And I actually went to a friend's house and drank a cup of water, and they, they kind of freaked out on me. And uh, were like, what are you doing drinking the water? And that's when I found out that the water was bad. One spill would have been bad enough for someone like DJ. All right, y'all be careful. Several years ago, many residents in the town of Printer say they began to notice that their water smelled strange. And it started out as just like they didn't know what it was exactly, uh, couldn't explain it. Uh, so they started doing tests and stuff and found multiple uh, chemicals in uh, pretty much all the wells up through here. Did they, were, did, were they able to clean up the water? Or? No, uh, they kind of ran city water up through here. Um, wait, 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 wait. So they ran city water? They ran city water up through here and gave it to everybody. Uh, Okay, four or five years ago, you realize water's contaminated. You get on city water from Charleston, and then that gets contaminated. Yeah. 
If we're choosing from two evils here, like, I mean, it's, it's either uh, water that we've drank all of our lives that we're used to by now, um, that's contaminated, or water that we just got that is also contaminated. So, like, uh, a lot of people went DJ to told me that for years, mining companies have pumped coal waste into the ground near Printer, contaminating the well water. Community surveys have found elevated rates here of kidney and gallbladder disease. The people settled with the companies out of court. Here, if you didn't work for the coal mine, what would you do? What other jobs are there here? Gas station. Can't be too many jobs at the gas station. No. The mining companies around Printer actually reported that they were violating their permits, disposing of their toxic waste. But the State Environmental Protection Agency never issued any fines. Historically, the coal industry has been a dominant force here, both economically and culturally. This is a beautiful area. And then you see these, like, these, these really terrific creeks and rivers that are blue and green. And every time you see it, the first thing you think is, that's gorgeous, that's nature. And the second thing you think is, or are those mining chemicals? And you really don't know. There's been so many instances of contamination here. It just makes you kind of question the beauty of everything and wonder what's poison and what's not. To see how mining operations work, we'd requested site tours from several mining companies, but they declined. So we asked Scott Simonton for help. An environmental engineer and scientist, he studied mining and its impact on water for decades. He's also a pilot. A lot of these mining sites are restricted, so we can't get to them on the ground down here. So today we're gonna take to the skies to see what they look like from above. Coal from West Virginia is facing competition from other states and from natural gas. After extracting the most easily accessible coal over the past few decades, companies have turned to a faster, more aggressive process to get what's left. Mountaintop removal. The top of a mountain is blasted off to expose the seams of coal. Heavy metals that have been locked in the rocks for millennia are exposed to air and water. Pretty much anywhere you see cleared areas up here on mountaintops, those are surface mining sites. Chemicals, like the one that leaked into the Elk River, are used to wash the coal at prep plants like this to separate the coal from rock and clay. The waste that's left over, known as slurry, is pumped into impoundment lakes. Sometimes it's piped into abandoned underground mines. If it leaks out, slurry can be a major source of contamination to groundwater. Mining impacts groundwater, period. The problem is that you've got just a myriad of contaminants and contaminant routes or pathways, you know, surface water, groundwater, air exposures, and so all kinds of different contaminants and, and people being exposed in lots of different ways. So it's really hard to come up with this contaminant traveled this way and caused this problem. Is part of what you do an attempt to stop mining? No, I don't think so. What I want is to better understand the impact, what has been called the externalities of coal mining. You know, to me, the whatever the price of a ton of coal is today, $100 a ton or whatever, doesn't truly reflect the cost to these communities or these, these externalities, the cost to people's health, the cost to the environment. To me, you can't even have a discussion of whether coal mining is good or bad unless you understand what the costs and the benefits are.
In West Virginia's coal country, it's not hard to find people who say their water is polluted by mining. In the small hollow of Cedar Creek, we went to talk to Sherry Walker. In the last few years, she claims she and her neighbors have all had their well water go bad. According to the nearby mining company's own reports, their site violated its permits hundreds of times from 2006 to 2011. The mining site's permit was renewed in 2012. When did you pour this? Uh, I got that yesterday. Have you had this tested? Uh, yes. And what did they tell you? Um, the water's terrible. It's got a lot of iron in it. It's got a lot of um, arsenic in it. Arsenic? Yes. It's got a high level of arsenic in it. It's like a snow globe of stuff you would not want to put in your body. So you're a quarter mile from a mine. Yeah, but if you go... Strip mine. Yes. My water didn't get this bad until they started all that. And then this is what I live with daily. And I know by the neighbors, they have the same situation. You know, it's a lot of hassle. Be grateful if you've got good water. Your water has arsenic. Sherry's water, as well as her neighbors, has levels of toxins above normal safe drinking water standards. She believes the bad water has affected the health of her family, especially her son, Jason. Uh, Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease, what's that? Um, it's, um, it's a digestive disorder. I really think it's from the water. Is there any way to prove it's from the water? No. You know your water's bad, and you know you're sick, but it's hard to have that, that, that smoking gun and, and... Well, most of the minerals that's bad on that actually gives you health problems digestively. Digestive health problems. Yes. In spite of their health problems, nice Sherry tells me she is disappointed that a mine in her area is having trouble getting its permits. They have to go through a lot of channels to get permits mm -hmm. to come in an area and start everything up. Has, has, has anyone said it's Obama's war on coal? That's Yes. Uh, that has a lot to do with a lot of men losing their jobs. Do you, do you think the mines are overregulated? Yes, I do. I mean, um, all my life, my daddy worked at the coal mines. Um, so I've been raised around the mining. Uh, my children's been raised around it. That's all I've seen, basically. Like Sherry, many West Virginians believe that tougher regulations would lead companies to cut jobs. As West Virginia's coal reserves get tapped out and its role in the economy begins to shrink, the industry has launched skillful PR campaigns across Appalachia to maintain its influence. The coal industry uh, and other industries could comply with law and make a profit and the jobs would be there, but they persuaded uh, legislators and politicians and indeed the public that uh, you can't have both and that's simply not true. Pat McGinley teaches environmental law and policy at West Virginia University, an important job in a state where private lawyers often have to step in for citizens when regulation fails. He says the recent freedom industry spill is just business as usual. It, it seems there are a lot of costs that fall to the people when regulation right. fails. These scenarios are repeated time and again in West Virginia and other states. Uh, it, it's just uh, uh, a corporate mentality, make a fast buck and uh, we'll get away with this. Uh, and if uh, actually the law is enforced, uh, we'll work the system and pay a low fine and, and uh, ultimately uh, we'll come out ahead. The Freedom Industry Tanks were built in the 1940s and 50s. Inspections by the DEP were few and far between. Mandatory leak prevention plans were never filed. 
it's basically a huge subsidy to polluting industries if they are allowed to operate without uh, complying with environmental regulations. Coal and chemical companies do bring jobs and money into a state that is struggling for both. But the lack of regulation comes with its own monetary cost. It's estimated that the public health burden from industrial pollution across Appalachia runs at nearly $75 billion a year. And while many in the coal industry and many politicians deny that the health fallout is real, healthcare providers on the ground have seen it daily. As a doctor in Southern West Virginia, Daniel Doyle often treats coal-filled residents. One of the clinics he works at is just outside Charleston, so he's also been seeing people who were impacted by January's chemical spill. It's a huge population cohort study, and it'll take us 10, 20, 30 years, maybe longer, to know what the long-term effects are. No question that it's an experiment. But mountaintop removal is an experiment. Um, the water pollution that's taking place is an experiment. Do you see the health consequences of mountaintop removal on the people who live around it? Definitely. In the last eight years, there's been a series of epidemiologic studies and finding clear association between mountaintop removal and cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, birth defects, certain cancers. And so there's a body of knowledge which coal companies are now actively investing in discrediting by sponsoring their own research institutes to try to find flaws in this. Mm -hmm. This is news that people don't want. We're pretty far off the grid here. This is classic Appalachia. There's no electricity. There's no cell signal here. It's a uh, Kayford Mountain. And uh, we're meeting a former federal regulator, Jack Spadaro. So your grandfather was a miner? Yes, he worked at underground. For decades, Jack's remit was to inspect mines and coal dams. Wow. wow. During that time, he helped write many of the laws that govern surface mining in the U.S., including the Surface Mining Act of 1977. Now he's a whistleblower. This is some of the most valuable coal in the world. It's uh, high quality. Uh, he claims that the coal industry has cultivated a culture of lax environmental regulation and enforcement over the past few decades. We're finding tens of thousands of adverse discharges that are not in compliance with the Clean Water Act, yet the state of West Virginia issued the permit and then fails to enforce the law after uh, the permits have begun. They could comply with the law. I mean, it's still quite possible to make a, a substantial profit and stay in compliance with the law. The, what they, they're doing is ignoring the law because they can increase their profits. But you're making the argument that the laws are on the books to make it safer, but they're not enforced. Why aren't they enforced? They aren't enforced because of the enormous power of the mining industry in a state like West Virginia to control the political process. We have had a series of governors, one in particular, his name is Joe Manchin, and he is now a U.S. Senator, who has done everything he can to weaken the enforcement of environmental laws when it came to mining. I'm Joe Manchin, I approve this act. He came out of the mining industry, he was beholding to the industry. He has paid them back by appointing people who will not enforce the law. To get the federal government off of our backs and out of our pockets. I sued EPA and I'll take dead aim at the cap and trade bill. Joe Manchin is one of West Virginia's most prominent politicians and one of the coal industry's strongest advocates in Washington. Since running for the Senate in 2010, he's received over $660,000 from the mining industry and nearly $100,000 from the chemical industry, not including a $225,000 ad buy. We wanted to ask him if his ties to industry impact his decisions on regulation, and if January's spill changed the way he views environmental enforcement at home. Hi, Senator Manchin. Hi. Hi. Has the spill with freedom industry changed your view on government regulation in West Virginia? 
what now? The spill, the freedom industry spill, oh, 300,000 people. Very concerning. But hey, I'll tell you what you can do. I'm, I'm running into a meeting right mm -hmm. now. John, set something up. We'll get together, okay? Okay, okay great. We will. Right. Okay, thanks. We were told the senator was too busy to meet with us. Back in West Virginia, the State Department of Environmental Protection declined our request for an on-camera interview as well. But in a statement, told us that across the agency, violations are taken very seriously. And from 2009 to 2013, their division of mining issued $15 million in penalties. We wanted to see how the industry felt about the level of regulation here. So we went to talk to the West Virginia Coal Association. They represent 90% of the state's mining industry. Underground. Bill Rainey is the president. Yeah. Do you think the DEP in West Virginia does a good enough job of what it's supposed to do? I do. I do, and, uh, and, and you know, we struggle with them, and, and you argue with them, and, uh, but you work with them. Mm -hmm. and, and they know what's best for West Virginia. It doesn't need to be dictated from Philadelphia or Washington because the guys here in West Virginia know what's best. Why do companies have such a hard time, how would I put that, not violating their permits? It, it seems like permit violations are kind of a part of the game. They, I don't know that they're part of the game. There are so many, uh, so many moving parts on a mining operation and so many standards to meet and so much activity that you're going to have interruptions. And if they're serious, they need to be fixed. The vast majority of, of the people and the people that I'm proud to represent, they're wanting to do the right thing because they live here. They, you know, they're not going to do anything to mess up the future of this state. DJ Estep is trying to help his community face the uncertainty about the health of the water supply after the freedom industry spill. <laughs> Most people in the U.S. never have to think about whether the water in their tap is safe. DJ has been thinking about it since he was a teenager. 17 years old, you're having back pains and throwing up blood. So you went to a doctor, and what'd you find out? And it was a rare kidney disease. A rare kidney disease. Do they know what caused that disease? Um, yes, my specialist determined that it was um, from the spill, the chemical spill, Massey. Massey was one of the companies that pumped coal waste into the ground for years around Printer, far beyond what their permits allowed. DJ says he drank what he claimed as contaminated water through his entire childhood. He told us that his doctors have told him that the damage can't be repaired and that they don't expect to live past his 30s. They took away, I mean, they took away my, my life. Like they, uh, they took away, I feel like I'm rushing all the time because I'm trying to, trying to get things done. I went to a protest in Charleston. We, we were going to deliver water on the governor's front yard, and they refused us. They refused us to be around the governor's front yard. They refused to be in parking spots. Uh, we're threatening arrests, and that showed me personally that he didn't care about the water as much as he cared about his own property. A lot of us lost a lot more than just property. It's amazing uh, what the price of a life costs these days. <laughs>